Hello, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, and we're doing a little bit of an earlier taping today. Arusha Pires is going to be joining me today, as always. He is a portfolio manager at O'Neill Global Advisors, and we got to share some time on IBD Live, and now here live uh, during the market session, uh, we're going to be on the show again. Hey, how's it going, Arusha? Justin, it's great, great to be here, and it's always fun uh, to, to be on with you. Yeah, and also joining us is Matt Caruso, president of Caruso Insights. Uh, he's rejoining the show. Always some great uh, commentary from you, Matt. Thank you so much for being here again. You're one of my favorite educators. I think you just do such a great job at putting all of these lessons in. So we're looking forward to some lessons from you today. How are you, Matt? I'm good. Thanks for, so much for having me back again. It's always a pleasure to be here with you and uh, Arusha, of course. Okay, very good. So uh, let's get started a little bit. Uh, we're going to cover, of course, some of the market action that's going on right now. And also, Matt is going to kind of share some lessons about what to look for, you know, uh, relative strength lines, how to tell when a follow-through day is going to work, and um, all of the things to kind of get, get a sense of where we're at in this current market. And I'm sure we're also going to be talking about some oil and gas, because that's something that uh, Matt has brought up a number of times when he's been on the show and also on IBD Live. So let's get right into it. Uh, again, we're we're live during the market hours right now, so you're going to see some changes as we go through. But let's go ahead and pull up the NASDAQ composite and start there. It looks like we uh, got above that 12,000 level, and right now we're struggling to hold it. Yeah, you know, we had that fall through day uh, earlier in the week, uh, sorry, or rather last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, I think it's always important to note, it's, it's been the theme for the past, I don't know how many months now, but the NYSC has definitely been the stronger of the two indexes. So, you know, uh, the NASDAQ was down about 30% or so from its all-time highs. And if you take a look at the NYSC, it's just much stronger, obviously, given the weighting in the cyclicals and the oil and gas sectors, which has really benefited this index. Uh, so even though there was a fall through day on the NASDAQ, when you really want to boil it down, where is that relative strength? What's leading this market? And it even comes through right on the indexes with the NYSE mm -hmm. being a much healthier chart. Yeah, oh, that and that was certainly uh, the first one above the 21-day moving average line. Mm -hmm. But what were you going to say, Arusha? No, I, I think that's a, a real, really good point. It, it's, you have to really kind of go where the market's telling you to go. And even though the NASDAQ got that fall through day, uh, it has consistently been the weakest of the indexes, especially when you compare it to the, the NYSE or even the S&P 500. Yeah, and even the S&P 500 has all of that exposure mm -hmm. with, you know, Apple, Google, a lot of the big tech names having pretty heavy weights in that. So, Matt, um, with, with the NYSE kind of showing uh, more strength, are there certain levels that you're looking at for that index uh, to kind of guide you um, or are you kind of looking at all the indexes? I'm really looking at all of the indexes. Um, what I, The way I've been kind of describing this market is very much, it's a, I would say it's a push-pull kind of market. So there, there is that commodity thing that's pushing higher because there's real supply constraints and demands coming back online. But then there's, there's that strong pull by the Federal Reserve and higher interest rates. So it makes it a very difficult market to, to trade because even if you are focused on that oil gas sector, which I have been for about a year now, um, you know, just when you think you're getting ahead, then after the market gets kind of so weak because of, you know, Fed talk or Fed action, it'll pull back even against those stocks that are pushing higher. So this is really one of those markets where there's there's no forgiveness and there's no room for error. It's kind of like, you know, flying a, a fighter jet. You know, you, you can't really make a mistake or get sloppy. So um, I, you kind of really want to look around and I, I just keep trying to understand where's the strength. Is there any strength that's sustainable? And, and and the more I look around, really, it's still just pretty much that oil and gas sector, although there are some health stocks are looking better. But outside that oil and gas sector, there's not a ton of, of real strength. Yeah. And so overall, we've been pretty much in a correction for most of 2022. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So three out of four stocks are going to go with a trend. And we've seen that now one of those four stock, but one of those four stocks are the oil stocks. Right. How have you balanced that? Because a lot of times I find it personally it's been pretty challenging, you know, when you're trying to go against the grain, even though you're right. Uh, how have you managed that? Are, are you have you maybe reduced risk a little bit or you're familiar with these areas? And so you're just going to really let the charts do the talking and, and you're kind of just acting as you're as if you're in a bull market. Yeah, I, I so I am a little more experienced with, with the sector, but um, 
you know, you, you have to be cognizant of what the market's doing. And, uh, and, and there's, there's short-term moves that are going to push against you. I made the mistake a little bit uh, a month or two ago. I mean, none of us are perfect. I was a little bit too, too aggressive in the oil and gas mm -hmm. space. I was on margin. Then we had kind of a, a strong reversal, one-day reversal. If you bring up uh, even, let's say, the XLE, which is a little more apparent on the stocks because, uh, well, he doesn't look so bad here. But I think it was early May. There's that, that big one-day drop. And that was really because, yeah, a little to the right. Yeah, right? the end of April? Okay. Oh, yeah, oh, that's oh, that right. one. Oh, okay. That one there. That one, it was a one-day. But when you're kind of leveraged mm -hmm. and you're concentrated, that can play quite a bit of havoc. So that kind of caused me to lose some nice positions after that. Kind of just like went straight up after that. So. You know, sometimes uh, even when you're trying to be uh, focused and diligent, you get a little too aggressive in a bear market and that can cost you. So there are there are those kind of mistakes you have to be careful. Like I said, this is kind of the market where there's no room for error. Any error is going to gonna cost you. Uh, but I, I've really been focusing on both the USO for oil and the XLE for the stocks. And I've been saying, you know, I'm focused on these commodity stocks. There's really a really fundamentally bullish reason as to why they're long. So uh, I'm I'm watching the general market indices but in terms of my positioning for these markets i'm kind of using these as my market gauges rather than the qqq for example mm -hmm. so you're recognizing you know while there's this bear market going on in, right. in the nasdaq there's certainly a bull market going on here um are, are you doing investments in the etfs or do you boil it down to individual stocks for for yourself personally so primarily i go down to individual stocks but i currently have a position in uso and mm -hmm. the reason for that is sometimes the correlation of the commodity itself to the to the general index is it will usually be lower than the commodity stocks. So sometimes I, I know it's not a ton of diversification, you know, oil stocks and, and the price of crude oil itself. Um, but you'll you'll notice that sometimes the stocks are just a lot more jumpy and the commodity mm -hmm. itself could be a, a little more subdued. So I, I kind of try and have a, at least some weighting in the commodity itself. Also. Because there, there's so many drivers right now, um, sometimes there's a kind of a spike in oil because of news related, and that won't necessarily cause a big jump in the stocks because the stocks are really priced according to longer term expectations of crude oil. So if investors think, oh, you know, like they did, I think, back near around the uh, launch of the Russian-Ukrainian war, they thought, oh, this is going to be a short term blip. So oil spiked, like you can see on that stock chart, and the commodity mm -hmm. stocks were a little more lethargic. So. Sometimes it's nice to have uh, some exposure to the actual commodity itself when that's the driver of the move. So I, I try and have that balance a little bit in the portfolio. Now, you mentioned that uh, a couple of weeks ago when oil came in really hard mm -hmm. or XLE came in really hard on that one day, you got shaken out of some of those stocks. But right. some of those stocks you've been in for a while, so right. like maybe almost a year or so. So mm -hmm. were you able to handle some of those really uh, big pullbacks? in those stocks before because i know personally the reason why i'm asking because i was getting shaken out earlier on at some of those because yeah they're just for, a for me it was late animals. april <laughs> yeah exactly it's um uh, so yeah. how, how'd you handle it because i know you've been in number of energies like for quite a while um how'd you handle it back then did you lighten up or did you just keep your full position knowing that there was a larger story and you wanted to play it for the bigger move it was a combination i wasn't as concentrated and actually I, i've when the market's kind of quiet and I, I take the time to do studies and I just realized some of those very uh, hard drawdowns in, in the account usually always happens when I'm kind of on margin, which it mm -hmm. makes sense. But, you know, when you kind of start to put some numbers to it and build a model around, it's like, oh, you know, light bulb moment. You know, why didn't I think of this before? Yeah. But early in the year, I, I was a little more uh, conservative in terms of overall exposure, which helped me to weather those, those pullbacks. But really what kind of... Um, got me, I guess, a little bit more that day was that those were the biggest single one day drops on those stocks for the entire mm -hmm. advance. The other pullbacks were over a series of days. So there wasn't anything so dramatic. And um, yes, yeah, so if you go back to the XLE, that was a big one day drop. You, you don't see any other bar going back to the beginning of the year that was so dramatic of a one day drop. So, you know, I started to question, you know, the Fed was talking even even tougher. And we had our, our first uh, 50 basis point hike, I believe, already at that point. So it was, you know, will there be demand destruction now or are or investors uh, starting to position themselves for demand destruction? Because ultimately, if the Fed, you know, will say, you know, damn be the economy, if we have to bring down inflation, that will impact the oil trade eventually. Right. It's, it's not immune to that. Um, so that was kind of my fear and, and being a little over overly concentrated. It forced me to, to be defensive, to keep, you know, you want to stay positive on a year like this, especially with the markets as they're they're acting. So that that's kind of what got me was the size of that one day drop. But, you know, sometimes the markets never make it easy on you. 
Mm -hmm. Well, to that end, you know, the, the, the oil trade, and again, maybe if we just look at the weekly chart of XLE, mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly there was the, the COVID crash that really, you know, sticks out on this chart uh, and, and the recovery that, you know, it, it, it went sideways for a bit in 2020, but even 2021, you know, had a lot of strength, especially kind of to, to end 2020 and to start 2021 you had almost a, you know, a hundred percent move here in XLE. Yeah. And now that's continuing. Um, is there a concern, you know, again, for people that maybe are just kind of catching on, you know, I mean, is, is this too late? Has the train already left the station? Um, is, is there more room for this to run? Do you think? So I think it depends your time frame. Uh, but, you know, you can kind of look, obviously, there's always the argument are, are two ways. But one, if you just look at what the weight is of energy in the S&P versus what it's been historically, it's very, very low. Also, if you look at what the price to earnings ratio are on these stocks compared to the historical, like if you bring up, let's say, FANG, Diamondback Energy, uh, just by comparison, if you look in 2018, I believe it was earning, uh, was that about $6 there, uh, yep. Arusha? 604, yep. 604, we were $140 a share. Uh, this year, we're expecting north of... You know, twenty-four dollars, and we're still only one hundred and fifty-four dollars a share. So investors haven't given any more valuation to the company, despite you know uh, quadrupling their earnings. Part of that you have to question is, you know, are, are people maybe starting to think that the longer-term road for energy is is not there? I mean, maybe right now there's a supply crunch. A renewable is going to take the place. You know, four years from now, maybe they're not willing to to provide a 20 times multiple because they think in 20 years there won't be the same kind of oil and gas demand. So these are the kind of um, the, the, the discussion I'm having with myself on, on these topics, because if, if you look at historical weights, if you look at valuations, you are, it's still very early. I mean, you could, you could easily make the case if we got even just to similar valuations of a few years ago, this stock would have to quadruple just to get to a similar yeah. valuation. So it's not late by that stretch, but, has the longer term that longer term dynamics change for the industry and once the supply crunch ends is this the final hurrah i, I don't i don't know that so that's why so that's why i mean it's always great to have that technical ability to, to to pivot because if suddenly there is a big change but you're waiting for this valuation catch up that never comes at least you can still make a profit and not get run over in the process no you, you bring up a good point about just with the indexes, how low the percentage of energy is mm -hmm. and i mean i wonder is yeah, is it really going to get back to those historical values, right? Are our funds actually going to maybe change their mandates? Is that was that due more to or towards demand for those stocks, or was it also ESG more of the right. kind of changes in the mandates? And so, does that expectation kind of they get back to those historical levels? Uh, is that even realistic? You know, the, I mean, so those are kind of the things that I talk to myself about uh, if, if that is. Now, that being said, I think in the end, you want to keep it simple and look at the charts. And in the right. and if they keep working, you know, you want to try to stick with them if they if you can manage your risk. At the same time, there's some companies like uh, Devon Energy, DVN. I, I think it's yielding uh, almost 8 uh, percent, maybe a bit less now. 6.7 now. 6.7. Yep. The stocks moved up, so the yields come down. Uh, but there's also there's also a variable component, which obviously I assume they're going to hit given on their, ca their cash flow with oil prices. So that'll bring it close to a 10 percent yield. So if you have a company that's paying 10 percent and there's some growth, even if it's not staggering growth past this year. I mean, in this kind of terrible environment where you have, you know, uh, you know, six, seven percent inflation bonds are giving you two or three percent. And if you have a company that could even just kind of hold this earnings for the next five years and pay 10 percent a year. I mean, depending your your outlook, what your what kind of portfolio composition you want, uh, there's still a good argument for these stocks, you know, right, on that That's basis. True. So, I mean, I think this is kind of one of those weird times where value investors and growth investors kind of overlap. It doesn't happen very often that these these they mm -hmm. come together. I think that's one of those uh, situations right now, just given uh, both the fundamentals, the growth numbers, and also the valuations. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, uh, you know, the P.E. ratios, uh, you know, I mean, you, you started that with Fang. Uh, that's not something we normally look at, but mm -hmm. it's something that's hard to ignore right now in this market because it, it seems like it does matter. And certainly the the stocks that were more speculative, uh, the, the much higher P.E. ratios, right. those were the stocks that were getting decimated. And certainly if you look at something like Arc K. Uh, you know, where it, it had a larger representation of speculative stocks, um, that's that really fell out of favor. Yeah. And I think P.E. can be used in different ways. I mean, I think traditionally people use it for 
a way to find a low value stock to purchase this so in a predictive way, which I know William O'Neill never was uh, favorable about, neither am I. But uh, other ways I look at, to like, like to look at PE is, you know, one is, you know, what are possible valuations? Work is this stock in mm -hmm. this historical range? So what's possible? Also, PE, in my opinion, is also, uh, you know, a, a sentiment tool, because if, if they're not giving a similar PE as they did in the past, then they don't have faith in this company for some reason or, or for further uh, future expectations are lower than what we think it is. So, I mean, the PE is giving you information now. Is it predictive? I don't use it in that way, but it helps me to understand what's a possible range of outcomes and what are investors thinking. So that's always, it's nice to have, you know, what can this resolve itself if everyone suddenly becomes giddy and believes that energy is the next big thing, which can happen. I mean, I remember 2011, 2014, everyone wanted to be an energy analyst and, you know, fast <laughs> forward, nobody, everyone thinks it's over. So it's kind of this yin and yang of the marketplace, yeah. but uh, you know, it's good to give some perspective. Like you said, are we early? Well, possibly if, if we would get to a, a, a normal valuation, but will we, that's, that's the question, you know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. so good. Yeah, I think that's really interesting on that, what you're talking about with the ranges, because the one way that I did see Bill O'Neill use PEs was a lot of times to give himself a sense of a range of what, what could happen. And a lot of times he would look at, okay, if we get an expansion of the PE, mm -hmm. which is often something that happens with growth stocks, uh, then, you know, let's say you keep earnings the same, what what price would you expect with some type of expansion? And usually he would use 130%. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to use it instead of just the blunt instrument of, right. hey, this is a value. <laughs> this is a good value here. Um, you know, there's a lot more sophisticated ways to use that ratio. Well, when we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into uh, some lessons uh, from this market. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Wondering how to navigate market volatility in this unprecedented time? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how machine learning technology can forecast stock market trends up to three days in advance with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds. Don't trade harder, trade smarter. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com and see a free live demo today. Limited time only. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Paris. And our guest this week is Matt Caruso from Caruso Insights. So, uh, Matt, let's talk a little bit about what people might be able to learn uh, from this market. And I think the first thing that we can start with is, you know, we just had a follow through day not too long ago that, you know, failed almost immediately. Here we have another follow through day that we got last week. Um, what's, what's your expectation once, once you have a follow through day? So I think people, uh, maybe have a little bit of a misinterpretation of the follow through day sometimes. This is the way I've, I've learned to understand that after reading William O'Neill's book about 5,000 times, at 4,999 <laughs> times, I right. figured something out, I think. Yeah. But, you know, people tend to look, they want to see a win rate. So how often does this follow through day work? You know, they want to have a high win rate. They want to know oh, when this mm -hmm. happens, oh, I got this, this sureness that we're going to have a bull market. I think the better way to look at it is, is expected return. So even assuming it was a coin flip, let's say half the time it's right, half the time is wrong. People say, well, there's not much use in using a tool like that. Well, I'd argue if when it's correct, it leads to, let's just say, a 30% rally. And when it's wrong, it leads to only a 10% decline. It still provides you a lot of information. You would still want to act on those signals because when you're right, you're very right. Mm -hmm. And even going beyond the effectiveness of the follow through day, it's not, I don't think it was ever intended to actually trade the market. It's really more of a guide to understand when institutions are coming back to the market and when is it a healthy time to buy stocks. And so if you look at it from that lens, even if the fall through day were to happen and there's even a, a mediocre 10 or 15% rally, but on the backdrop of that, you have individual stocks that can rock at 40, 50, 60, or 70% because they've been held down by a bad market. Well, that's still a tremendous opportunity. So even if you know one or two or three follow through days fail, if you have controlled exposure and, and then after the one that works, you have these great moves in these stocks, it's still a very valuable tool because otherwise, you know, it, it's very difficult to find, you know, what is the, what's the reasoning? Why do I start looking to buy stocks now? And that follow through day kind of gives that, that perspective. Yeah. I, I think the, the, you nailed it there, man. I, I think the, the key is we're buying the stocks, right? We're not necessarily buying the market. We're just using that just to try to figure out is the environment, could it be changing to reward these stocks where we're going to get concentrated into, 
Um, and so you don't necessarily need that market to always do so well uh, mm -hmm. if, if those stocks are starting to do well. So going back to the energy stocks, right, where mm -hmm. you got in at the early at the end of last year, were you using a fall today to get in at that point? Was the market acting OK at that time when you were getting into those stocks? Yeah. So, I, you know, whenever I try and put on exposure, I want to have a healthy market. I mean, if the market becomes unhealthy, but you have a really large cushion or your stock is acting, you know, phenomenally great, then you can sit with it and give it a little more, uh, you know, a, a wiggle room. But it's very hard to initiate in a poor market. Um, but if you're ready and you really follow the stocks that have strong relative strength that are holding up well, I think this past week is just such a perfect example of what you can expect. If you bring up um, any oil, let's say uh, P10, P-T-E-N, we can go into more detail about this stock afterwards. But if you look at right about the time, the, the market bottom, that little black line at the top there, the, the S&P line, you know, the market has just this little, a little tick higher in the past week, but this stock bolted 25% higher in five or six days. So the market has a big weight. Um, but if you, you can balance, you know, when that's, that market is, the relief is coming to the marketplace and then, you know, know which stocks to pivot to, that's really where the strength comes together. There's, there's multiple parts. It's not easy. The market never makes it easy on you. But I think, you know, historically, especially when you study, you can see like this stock was just kind of held down because of that bad market. The second that market came off straight up, same thing. If you look at Devon Energy again or or uh, Oxy, uh, you can see it was the second that market kind of just like clicked up a little bit. And it was almost day after day we went higher. So uh, and, you know, sometimes people want to say, you know, I'll buy if the market's going to rally, let me buy the, the most beat up stocks on the market because they have more upside. Right. But if you look at, let's say, a Shopify, which has been, you know, was a phenomenal growth company, which has fallen onto harder times that did come off the low, but it came off the low to a lesser degree than some of the oil stocks did. And in the process, you had much greater risk because this is a stock in free fall. So, I mean, where do you where do you limit your risk if you're buying this thing? There's no. There's no easily identifiable point where you'll exit, where it's on the oil stocks, you can say, oh, if it breaks lower, I'll get out of it. So you got an equivalent upside, actually even a little less in the beat up name, and your risk was dramatically higher. So even if you are looking for this turn, you know, and I've fallen victim to that too. You say, wow, this is such a great company in the past. It's down 80%. It'll be so easy for it to double. But, it, you know, it doesn't quite work that way because there's just so many sellers who are just so happy to get out of this on the first little bounce higher and um, and so after it actually ends up underperforming, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know what? Um, kind of getting back to what you were uh, saying a little bit earlier, I think this is important, and I want to make sure we kind of stress it because it's almost like a portfolio management thing that you're talking about, where you have to kind of recognize how much the return is and how little sometimes the risk is. And I think a lot of that comes down to making sure that you're cutting your losses yeah. quickly, not letting those losses get too big. So again, the, the risk a little to gain a lot idea. I, I mean, this is why Bill had the whole three to one ratio idea where mm -hmm. if you're taking profits at 20 to 25% and you're cutting your losses at most seven to 8%, you can have a lot of losses and, mm -hmm. and have a, a worse win rate, but still make a lot of money. So can, can you just maybe get a little bit more into that? Yeah, I think, and I think that's a universal principle of uh, all successful investors or anybody who deals with anything of buying and selling a probability. I mean, William O'Neill's really been, uh, I guess, the the mentor that I, I've chosen for my investment strategy. But I, if you read some of the other greats like Paul Tudor Jones, even in Market Wizards, he stresses he looks only for opportunity where there's, you know, the reward is five times larger than the risk. And I, and I've grabbed, you know, I like Bill's three to one, but I've gravitated to looking for at least five to one. So that's why, you know, when you're looking at these stocks like a Shopify, sure, maybe there's a 20% upside, but if you also have a 20% downside because the, the stock is basically moving 20% every two or three days, that's a one to that, you know, people say, oh, 20% is great. No, but it's, it's only one reward unit for one risk unit. Whereas mm -hmm. these energy stocks, you know, maybe like a, like a Patterson Energy, you have a 5% risk, but you made 25% in a week. So that's five times. And then you're in the driver's seat and you're in the stock that's growing well. So it's it's just so I always tell people you have to get past the idea of what you know when do I buy what do I buy, and the whole system has to work together. And this kind of market is the the type of market where if there's any kind of um, failure in your system or or something you, you didn't look at or you weren't aware that you needed, the market's going to exploit it and you'll pay for it somewhere. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think we've all been there. But the portfolio aspect, like you mentioned, Justin, is so critical, and it helps too because oftentimes 
it'll have you avoid these low probability setups because you're thinking about reward versus risk. And, you know, it's not about any one trade. It's about a series of trades and over five, 10 trades will I be profitable. And that's the way you have to really, I think, keep your mind focused. Yeah. And going off of that fall through day where you have this concept, it, you don't necessarily need to be all in at that point. You don't need right. to go hundred percent on that right. signal. You can go 30, 40% in, buy some of these faster moving stocks that have the potentially asymmetric uh, reward to risk ratio and do really well while still having a lot in cash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the whole point, you know, that's why you kind of need that perspective when you're building your strategy is if I'm looking to, you know, if the fall through day is going to signal a new rally, then, okay, we have to assume that rally will last at least, let's say two, three, six, nine months. Well, there's going to be time to put on more exposure. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no need to put it on all at once because if you put it on all at once and it's just a quick two day rally and then you're, you're hit with losses, it's really going to hurt. But if, if you put that progressive exposure on and there is that six month rally, you get all of the upside. I mean, you, you've lost very little by buying just a little bit later and, but you're not exposed to your downside. So again, you want to look at what's the expected return and also build those positions. I mean, I think especially as individual investors, it's a, it's a, it's a huge advantage that you have that liquidity to get in and out of stocks without a problem. And for me, the kind of the light bulb moment was when I, I was, you know, trading and I saw the institutions buying these stocks. I said, well, you know, they're buying day after day after day after day. Why do people feel the need that they have to buy all at once? I mean, the, the, the best in the world, <laughs> the biggest, the deepest pockets don't do it that way. Why does everyone else think they have to do it that way? Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I, I build my positions over three or four buys to spread out my risk. And, and if the trend is correct, well, then I have a heavy concentrated position. Mm -hmm. So speaking of concentrated, uh, you've been mentioning how you're, you're looking at relative strength lines and certainly uh, the relative strength lines have been dominated uh, by the oil and gas industry, the energy plays. So what happens when you see all the setups in a certain industry, um, how concentrated do you allow yourself to get not just in one stock, but in energy, let's say again, you know, that's, that's been one of the only yeah. things working. So um, how do you kind of manage that where you don't get those situations? I mean, again, like I got, I got whacked at the end of April. Um, you know, you were talking about mm -hmm. at the beginning of May. And if you, if you get too heavily concentrated, then you get shaken out of, of everything yeah. because there's just too much pain in a given day. Yeah. It's very difficult because I mean, either you say, I'm not going to get concentrated in a sector and you keep cash or if you, you do want to be more heavily invested, you're going to have to kind of live with that concentration. I mean, there's the way I look at it, there's no point in diversifying if you have to diversify into a poor investment. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I think that comes out to the individual. I like to diversify in a couple of ways, to, at least in some way to, to diversify my exposure is, is one, I'll try and diversify within the sector. So there's, you know, there's the driller, there's the services. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there could be natural gas versus oil. So there are ways, obviously there's still a correlation because they're all energy sector related, but it's, it's better than buying four drillers. Cause I mean, then they'll, they'll move almost exactly the same. And then also uh, like Willem O'Neill talks about like diversify over time, you know, so you, you buy some, if it works, you add a little bit, at least your, your average cost is lower as you're building your position. So if there is this nasty one day turnaround, um, you know, it doesn't happen just as you put the position on it and your account is, you know, taking these massive losses, for the year you're, you're actually working with profit of the year i think that's the only thing that's you know allowed me to stay profitable on a year where the nasdaq's down 30 percent is all of these kind of cautious and layering it in approaches mm -hmm. yeah. now matt you, you've been teaching people for a while mm -hmm. um, what, what are some of kind of the pitfalls do you see of people that are new to the system or, or trying to go through a couple of cycles or maybe going through their first correction I think um, there's there's a few common errors I notice. One, people just focus on what's the best buy signal. And to me, that's kind of, you know, like if it's Formula One racing, I just want to know how I can go as fast as possible without thinking about corners or brakes or gas or any other issue. So you need to think about the whole system and it all has to work together. So if you're looking at a type of buy, you're trying to find these great growth stocks for these large advances, but then you're using a momentum indicator when it's overbought you're selling to take your profit well you'll never be in a sustained move because your sell signal doesn't work with your buy signal so first is you know you want to build out a strategy where it all kind of works towards the same goal and that takes a little bit of time to kind of sit through i think william o'neill does a great job of of explaining that but you can always make it your own and adjust that um a second mistake people make is they just think about the stocks they don't think about the portfolio and overall exposure 
Uh, you know, that like I, to me, ca my cash exposure is something I watch so vigilantly, so closely, because I just know when I have cash, I have breathing room and, you know, I can't get too hurt. When I get onto margin, I know I have to be very cautious and very selective on when I add. And I think people kind of just haphazardly build positions and some are bigger than others, some are smaller than others, and they don't actually have an approach to decide, you know, how much do I buy of a stock? How much should my portfolio be exposed right now? Should I be in the market? And so the way I've learned my skill over the years is I've basically made every mistake possible. And then after kind of made a note, like, oh, I, I think I need to figure that out better next time. And, and I just, that's how I kind of get over each plateau as an investor. But I mean, I made every mistake possible. So <laughs> it's just, a, uh, you can learn the hard way or the easy way. Actually, I think I went back and, and, um, you know, inadvertently had to reprove everything that Bill taught in his book. Said, oh, he was right about that. He was right about that. Yeah, right you, about you, that. you and me both. You and me yeah, both. Right. I had to break every rule multiple times. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you and it's funny. A lot of times I, I, I found that in rereading the book, you know, after doing a trading cycle, it would be like, oh, that's why he said that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or sometimes I think like, wow, look at this great thing I just came up and created. And I'll go back and read Livermore and O'Neill. It's like, oh, no, I, it must have been in my subconscious somewhere. They, they taught me that along the way. So that's, that's, not the uh -huh. genius, no. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, I mean, th th this is this is great stuff. And again, a, a lot of a lot of times, I, I guess some people look at, um, you know, I guess in a in a way, an unemotional way of how easy it is. Some of these rules are, but maybe talk about that emotional aspect because it's very different to to read about something mm -hmm. and think about it theoretically, but very different when you have yeah. money on the line. And as you said, when you're kind of balancing all of these different levers and switches to kind of get things exactly right, whether it's your cash position, um, your average cost, and all of those things. Yeah, I think people vastly underestimate what emotions do to your strategy. Yes. And whether you're a retail tra trader or institutional investor, mm. you know, if, if you're having a great year and, you know, friends and I, fellow traders would always say, you know, if trends would continue, you know, I mean, just keep going in that great, you know, upper <laughs> upper right uh, quadrant. But, you know, not only are you, you happy with that, your performance, you're doing great, but you say, wow, if I could only have this, you know, 40 percent return in three months, every three months. And you, it's just, I think, human nature. You take out an Excel sheet and you're like, wow, this is what I've Extrapolate. been working years. And then all of a sudden, you have this big drawdown. And, and so people think like, oh, okay, you have this drawdown. But your mind actually has to go from, I was expecting two years from now to be at this upper echelon of performance. And all of that is shattered. Plus, I gave back profits. And so psychologically, it's this big hit. I think that's why so many people, once they've had this big run, it's not even the loss of some of the profit that hurts, but they thought they found this new easy way to make this phenomenal money. They've extrapolated out into their future or they told their wife or their husband saying, mm -hmm. honey, don't worry about, I, I got this in the future. All the dreams you want are taken care of. I'll make the money. And then you have to go back and say, well, no, not only did I lose what I made, but I have to completely reassess all of my dreams. And so that's just one very small, like, well, not small, like it hurt, but one emotional error. But there's emotional errors at every stage of the investing process that you have to kind of, uh, learn and adapt and go through. Yeah, the, a, lot, a lot of times when I'm having a good year and I start thinking, you know, maybe one of these days I'll be able to buy that yacht. That's <laughs> when it's like, sell everything. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of stuff to unpack here. This is definitely something I think people might have to listen to a couple times because, again, there's a lot of lessons that sometimes you have to hear more than once and sometimes you have to do a little bit of trading, especially for people where if this is your first correction, um, I think there's a lot to learn from it. And one thing I will say in your favor, you might've made the mistakes, Matt, but the best thing is that you've learned from them and yeah, uh, have true. gotten better. So when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the stocks that are on Matt's radar. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Wondering how to navigate market volatility in this unprecedented time? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how machine learning technology can forecast stock market trends up to three days in advance with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds. Don't trade harder, trade smarter. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com and see a free live demo today. Limited time only. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. 
Okay, everybody, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Pires, Portfolio Manager at O'Neill Global Advisors, and Matt Caruso, President of Caruso Insights. So, Matt, uh, let's talk a little bit more about stocks, and we might as well start, uh, since you already brought it up, with oil and gas. Uh, how about P10? Sure. Uh, the reason I want to bring this one up, and this is one I'm long off of that uh, uh, trend line break on the daily chart, but what, uh, what really kind of drew this to me was earlier in the week, uh, yes, yeah, I think uh, you can actually draw a nice trend line coming down that base, a nice three-touch mm -hmm. trend line, like I call it, and that kind of broke out very nicely. And there was news in the UK, uh, which was the first time I, I kind of saw one of these Western nations do this, was that they were going to put a windfall profit tax on some of these oil and gas companies, but they were, which, you know, is I don't think is uh, very helpful in the situation for, to, to lower prices. But what they were going to do to counter that was they were going to provide a tax incentive, basically a tax write-off. For any investment in uh, production increases so up to 80 percent of the, mm -hmm. the investment could be written off so my mind kind of jumped immediately to, immediately to saying like well all these you know oil service companies are suddenly going to have a lot of demand because now basically it's always great when you're selling a profit uh, a product where it's almost you know tax-free and so that obviously makes it a lot more interesting for companies to expand production and so that space really spoke to me and not only was it good news but this was already on a company that had already really turned around if you look at the annual earnings, they had been negative for a number of years. They're finally expecting positive earnings next year. Uh, and this is only, I think, going to add fuel to the fire to, to, to further that. And that's why I think we got this really fast, dramatic upside run. And you saw it really across the industry. And this is another good example of kind of diversifying within the energy space. I mean, they're really services related rather than the oil drillers themselves. And this is how you kind of play the different components of the group. No, and you look at something like this know. with, um, you know, I mean, yesterday we had an outside day, a reversal. Um, so are you looking at this as more of a shorter term trade or is this something where because that legislation is in place, hey, this is something that will take some time to play out and, and could, could have further to go? Yeah, I think there's, there's further to go. If you actually switch back to the weekly chart, uh, this was already on my radar. And this is why I try and keep, you know, a, a list of stocks that have great earnings growth, sales growth, and price action. If you look at the run-up prior to this recent basing structure, uh, you look at the volume on the downside. There was kind of a lot of huge volume that came in on that, that run-up. Mm -hmm. And unlike Devon or Occidental, where this is probably base number, I don't know, 10 at this point, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is kind of um, new to the party. And I've noticed myself in these commodity cycles, the lower quality uh, stocks or the stocks that our services related or expansion related will do better at the end of the cycle rather than the beginning of the cycle. So early cycle institutions are hesitant about this, the industry. They want to buy, you know, the bigger, safer stocks, the Exxon Mobiles, the Chevrons, the Devons. As that speculative fervor comes in, they kind of start to move towards mid caps then small caps. And then people with bad balance sheets where suddenly at $150 oil, that's not a bad balance sheet anymore. And so that kind of changes over time. And so that's why, you know, P10 was on my radar. And the fact that the UK made that, made that announcement, I know Italy recently had a windfall profit tax. I didn't see anything about a tax incentive, but if the UK did it, if maybe the US would provide something like that or another country, you know, the fact that one did it, they tend to kind of copy or mirror each other, even if it's not exactly. I think that's definitely um, something in its favor. And I, I think you saw just the way it kind of raced out of this base was interesting. And it's, a, it's an earlier stage idea rather than the later stage ideas like the Devon and the Oxys. No, that's a re really good point, Matt. And now, do you usually, do you like to focus more on the weekly charts or the daily charts? Because these are still, I mean, I like the your description of kind of the rotation to the servicing group and uh, things like that. But as some, sometimes these stories take a little bit of time to play out. And so you need to be a little bit more patient with some of these moves and, and some of their pullbacks to key moving averages. Yeah, so it's, it's, I think my approach is a bit different. So I, I kind of started my, the first thing that got me investing was William O'Neill's book, mm -hmm. but then I ended up being a market maker and a pro trader where I was a day trader. So I kind of had these two worlds. Yeah. And so eventually like when I went on my own, I, I kind of compiled this system to kind of work together. So I, I kind of look for healthy stocks and ideas on a weekly chart and fundamentals. Then I'll time them typically with short-term patterns because I, I've just found that Sometimes there was a kind of like a buy pattern Bill would talk about, which is kind of obvious now because a lot of people follow the system and there's algorithms. And and I, from as a short term trader, I said I knew that mm, that's not a good place to buy the stock, but I'd buy it because that was a system and I got I get hit. So I start to use some of the shorter term patterns that I developed as a, a shorter term trader within the framework of this is a healthy stock, this is a healthy base, 
And so I really use the short-term patterns to get that great risk to reward, like Justin mentioned earlier. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier to get that five times reward, reward when your risk is very small. But once I put the position on with that shorter term pattern, then I kind of revert back to the weekly chart because the aim is to hold the stock for an extended run. So if then you stay focused on the shorter term patterns, you'll never stay in for a longer run. There's always a reason to sell somewhere. So I kind of focus on weekly uh, to find the idea. I time it shorter term on the daily and then I flip back to the weekly for sell signals. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, outside of oil and gas, uh, you were mentioning health. And uh, here's a biotech uh, stock that you've been looking at, Halozyme Therapeutics, uh, ticker symbol H-A-L-O. Um, what is it that looks interesting to you about this one? So there's a number of things that I really like about this company. First off, um, you know, the fundamentals are, are, are great. Uh, you can see that they're cash flow positive. Uh, they're expecting great earnings growth next year. Um, but what's interesting about this company is sometimes how good things can come out of failure. They were a biotech and one of their drugs they were working on failed. It didn't work out. And then they had this other enzyme that they were working with where basically, let's say uh, you have a health condition, you have to go to the hospital and you need an IV and it takes eight hours to deliver this drug in, into you. They have mm -hmm. a, a sugar-based molecule where uh, it helps with the injection site where basically what would take eight hours through an IV drip can be delivered in 14 or 15 minutes, even from home with this new wow. ap uh, um, mm. application. And so actually, so once, you know, the CEO realized their other blockbuster drug kind of didn't work out, they kind of put their full focus into this and, and they've developed it. And this had an initial run up in 2020. I even traded a little bit, but then it went into this big longer term base, which is almost a giant cup with handle now, essentially. But what really stands out is the right side of this cup is happening with the backdrop of a terrible market. Uh, and yeah. the relative strength line is at new highs, which is screaming. Um, so they have this really innovative product. Uh, they have a really strong focus by management. And you have this really big basing structure, which is showing a lot of relative strength. And what I like is it's outside the oil and gas space. It's a little bit of um, mm -hmm. a, a different exposure. So I'm not long this just yet. But this is on my high priority list to look for a, a proper entry. Uh, it's just been very, I was watching that near the 200 just about a couple of weeks ago, and it kind of went straight up like a bullet, and I missed it. Yeah. Um, but this is just a huge basing structure, really interesting story. And I don't personally like biotech stocks where they're testing for drugs, but I like diagnostic. I like application. I like um, health health adjacent. Let's just say like Lavongo mm -hmm. was you know uh, a great winner in 2020, but they weren't making the drugs. They were providing all this technology for the health space, uh, and I feel this fa falls very well into that um, into that model. And do you uh, ever take a look at, you know, again, especially with this company, it did have that that failed drug before. Mm -hmm. So how closely do you follow kind of the news and, you know, where it is on some of these, um, I guess, applications getting approved and everything like that? Yeah, it's important, especially for companies that are trying to get drugs developed. But that's why I just I personally don't focus on those companies because I, I don't have a deep understanding. And, and it's just, I mean, even if you do have a deep understanding, a trial can fail regardless if yeah. you know a lot about it or not. So, <laughs> yeah, it uh, just that, comes out of the blue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, there's a case to invest in there because obviously there's growth, but I think it takes a completely different approach, kind of like a venture capitalist where, you know, most venture capitalists will say, look, I have these 10 or 15 potential companies, but I'm going to take a, a five or 10% position each. So if any one fails, the whole portfolio is not at risk. But if you want to take more concentrated positions, uh, like my style of investing, it, it's not well suited to a biotech with that kind of headline risk. So that's why I, I do like the health space. It's obviously somewhere there's a lot of innovation right now and a lot of growth. Uh, but I like to work more with, uh, you know, to say that the person selling the shovels rather than the person doing the gold mining. So that's the way mm -hmm. I like to approach it. Well, and maybe we can, uh, you know, take a look at tech because, uh, again, tech has really been hit very hard. Um, but if we take a look at Box Inc., uh, this is in the computer software database area, mm -hmm. and it did seem like there were some some names here that were sh showing some strength. But um, you know, Box has pulled back to the 200-day moving average line, but it certainly doesn't look as bad as a lot of other tech names right. out there. That's right, and that's why I kind of hit my screen. So they have good earnings, good forward earnings with revised estimates to the upside. Those little green triangles are always things I like to see. Uh, but really what stands out is just how well this is held in uh, compared to the NASDAQ and compared to all other tech. And it's in a com competitive space. So they provide a lot of this, this cloud um, storage kind of, they're very mm -hmm. similar to Dropbox. This is Box. It sounds the same, but they're, they're yeah. actually competitors with each, each other with very similar <laughs> offerings. 
Um, what was interesting about Box is they have this great relationship with Microsoft and Office 365, which I think has been helping them. And um, so they have this great growth story. I think everything is going that direction. They have a lot of integrations. And just the fact that technically it's been so strong, I always want to have, even if tech is completely uh, a horrible place at the moment, the market could always change so quickly. So I always like to say, oh, if things do turn around and suddenly inflation is killed and people are back at the tech, what are some good tech go-to names that are on my list? And that's kind of where Box falls in. It's not something I'm along right now, but definitely the relative strength, the growth, and the product offering uh, ends up on the top of my list for in terms of tech stocks. So, so for something like this, now if you switch over to the daily, what what are some of the things that you might look for on a technical basis that would you know give you a little bit more uh, you know encouragement to to actually start building a position here? So I always begin with I won't ever buy anything below a two hundred day average. That's another kind of okay. Paul Tudor Jones rule from. Uh, market wizards, nothing good happens below the 200 day average. Right. And I just learned to respect that. So this is kind of flirting with the 200. Um, but really, I, I prefer stocks above their 50 day. It just makes it a lot easier. There's a lot less resistance. Uh, and I like to see stocks already starting the right side of their basing structure rather than trying to find the absolute bottom. So this okay. could start to come up the right side. That would just make it a lot easier uh, to put on a position. Um, especially since, you know, the market still is not really completely uh, out of trouble. I mean, we did have the fall through day, but you know, it would be nice to see a little more strength. Or if we're below the 50, I'd like to see kind of like a high volume thrust day where it's like, wow, something really changed dramatically. And it's, there's some kind of uh, momentum ignition happening. So either back above the 50 where we can see some short term patterns or like a high volume ignition bar uh, to show that there's kind of this real change of investor sentiment. Mm -hmm. Now, uh you know, we've been talking a lot about the technical action with these stocks, and I noticed that you did mention uh, some some fundamental things that you looked at, whether it was, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the cash flow or, um, in this case, the estimates uh, being so uh, strong. And especially, it seems like the estimates in a lot of places are not looking great. Um, so I guess I just wanted to get some insight into, into how you look at these earnings, especially right now. You know, you've got a lot of companies whether they're coming up against uh, tough comparisons or mm -hmm. whatnot, where the estimates aren't looking great. Um, or, you know, before with the oil and gas plays, you had a lot of these that, uh, as is the case with cyclical stocks, where it, they didn't have the earnings quite yet, mm -hmm. and those come later on. So how are you, how are you using the, the, the fundamentals? I think it comes down to, and actually, you know, this is something that reading again, Mark Wizard, Stanley Druckenmiller spoke about. He started as a bank analyst. And he kind of realized that each industry has its own uh, best metric to, to, de to determine what profitability will be. So, for example, the commodity space, I don't need to wait for earnings releases to find out if they're going to have a better quarter. If, if oil goes up 20 percent, they're going to make more money. It's fairly obvious. So that's so that's the way, you, you know, I kind of treat that sector. The commodity itself is so critical. So you have to really understand what are the drivers of, of that commodity in that space and whether there's upside potential for oil, because I understood the supply side and. A bunch of other factors that gave me a really bullish outlook early on so i was able to capture that i think when you're looking at technology companies what's more important is um are you going to be able to grow this company are, are you retaining customers is there a high uh, you know are customers increasing spend so can you get this uh, rolling um uh, compounding growth going on with the company to become this giant so it's, it's kind of a different metric that investors are going to look at and you have to kind of understand what the driver is for each sector but even beyond that, if you bring up, for example, a CrowdStrike, CRWD, they also they still have strong forward estimates. And this year had strong earnings estimates. But sometimes it just happens if, if there's too much excitement in the stock prior, people just already overpaid for those estimates. So I think that's the genius of William O'Neill where, yeah, these fundamentals are, are important. But then you also have to always kind of go back with the technicals because no matter how good the forward earnings are, if you overpay for them i mean then the stock is mm -hmm. already overinflated so even if they come in well you know you already paid more than you should have paid anyways and so the stock's still going to deflate so that's why it's really when those two kind of come together uh, i think it's the best of both worlds and that's why i put so much weighting myself personally on relative strength um and also the earnings i think the two of them the relative strength is is in my opinion what the market is is saying about future earnings and the earnings themselves are what the you know the trend that the company has been delivering so when you kind of bring those together I think that's the best way to get a, a full story. I, I remember in my CFA studies, they, they call that mosaic theory. You kind of bring as many pieces together to build a, your mosaic. And that's the way I like yeah. to approach it. 
Yeah, I mean, Proud Strike only has a, a PE ratio of 232 right now. So <laughs> yeah, after <laughs> which, ironically, in 2020, that was totally fine, you know. Yeah. But Wait, we you have earnings. I mean, just right, have right earnings. exactly. You, you know, uh, issue at all with something, right? Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And and the fact that it's 232 after correcting 50 percent is yeah. just absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, well, hey, Matt, uh, a lot of great insights, and you know, I I think people should be aware that you. You're, you're pretty active on Twitter, so where can people find some of these insights on a regular basis from you, uh, from Twitter? Yeah, so Twitter, my handle is at uh, trader underscore M Caruso, and there's my website, carusoinsights.com. Absolutely. That was going to be my next question. Uh, so a lot of great educational material, um, again, whether it's at your website or just on your ever, everyday uh, uh, Twitter. So thanks a lot for being here, Matt, and sharing your knowledge with our listeners. Thanks. A real pleasure. It's always great to talk to both you, Arusha and Justin, both uh, great guys. And next week, we're going to have Simon Erickson on the show. He is from Seven Investing, and uh, I haven't gotten to interview him myself, so uh, Arusha has. So now this is my chance to catch up. So hope you join us for that. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.